Hi, it's Dr. Crone. Today we're going to be talking about civil liberties. So that is the uh, topic for Unit 13 in our POLS 1100 online course. Uh, we'll study civil liberties this week, and then next week we'll be doing our unit uh, number 14 on civil rights. Uh, there's already a video on our website uh, that, that discusses the difference between civil liberties and civil rights, so I'm not going to belabor that point here, but just want to recommend uh, you again to make sure that you've seen that video at all, as well. That's uh, the Dr. Krieger uh, video. So this week's study of civil liberties, what's a civil liberty? Well, the word liberty basically means freedom. And so civil liberties are the freedoms that um, are usually uh, written into a constitution, not always. Some, some uh, countries, for example, Great Britain, have civil liberties that are not necessarily written into a constitution, but rather applied at the courts, uh, court level. Um, but in our country, they are spelled out in our constitution and in many democracies as well. And uh, these are freedoms that make sure that the government is not allowed to infringe upon our, um, our rights, our freedoms as individuals, citizens of the government. Um, and it's important to understand, and I think the reason the, the, it's bolded here on the slide is that we are trying to, um, the, the, the Bill of Rights and, and civil liberties in general, um, give us freedom from the arbitrary interference of government, meaning that there are some, um, uh, some good reasons the government might interfere in our liberties, uh, and uh, our liberties are not unlimited, uh, but rather that we can't have arbitrary interference of the government. Um, civil liberties are not absolute. We do not have unlimited liberties in this country. Unlimited liberty would be anarchy. Um, all, all of us are subject to some limits on our liberty. We don't have the liberty to go into our neighbor's house and take things. Uh, we don't have the liberty to uh, drive our car as fast as we want to without consequences. And the reason that our civil liberties aren't absolute is because uh, the government uh, has an, an important uh, job to do in uh, protecting the public and, and providing for public safety. And liberties and safety are not always uh, in, in harmony with each other. And so it's up to the government to figure out what are the uh, correct boundaries around liberties um, in order to uh, protect the public, but then also guarantee a lot of liberty. And every country has to kind of make up their mind about that on their own. Uh, in most countries, including the United States, most democracies, it's really falls to the court system to referee uh, the, uh, the needs of the individual to be free, particularly free from government interference with what's required by the government, what, what we need the government to do in terms of protecting public safety. Uh, and the courts are the arbiters of that. So we can have legislatures making laws, uh, but then ultimately the courts have to decide whether they've come down on the correct side of uh, protecting the public or whether they've gone too far and, and those protections infringe on guaranteed liberties. So before, even before the Bill of Rights were added, though, there were civil liberties included in the Constitution. They just were not the classic ones we tend to think of, like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, uh, the right to bear arms. Um, rather, they were uh, the, the most important uh, that was written into the Constitution was what's called habeas corpus, meaning that the government was not allowed to uh, put a, a citizen or put someone in jail without formally charging them with breaking the law in some way. So in other words, uh, the, the president or the Congress or um, even uh, the mayor of a little town couldn't just throw someone in jail that they didn't like. There had to be formal charges given in, other, in order to keep someone in jail. Um, another uh, right for us was that we should not ever be, uh, be held to what's called ex post facto laws. Ex post facto means after the fact. Um, in other words, uh, the Congress cannot make laws that apply uh, prior to retroactively, basically. Uh, in other words, if, if tomorrow it becomes a law that you're not allowed to make PowerPoints for uh, college courses, I can't be held liable for this one because it wasn't a law at the time that I did it. Um, and it also uh, made uh, the 
it, it allowed for what are called uh, bills of, retain, of attainder, meaning that the government could not punish somebody without uh, putting them to trial. And those were important rights. Those actually are drawn from uh, the British tradition, what are called the rights of Englishmen. Um, and these are, are very important, uh, very important rights that were codified into the Constitution before the Bill of Rights was put in there. Actually, you know, at, by the end of the Constitutional Convention, they were in there. So in the United States, at the national level, our, our, our civil liberties are uh, mostly codified in the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution. And if you'll remember, they are, uh, they are there uh, as a result of compromise that happened between um, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists during the fight for, uh, the, about the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, if you will remember, one of the main arguments of the Anti-Federalists against ratifying the Constitution right after the convention was that there was no Bill of Rights included, that, that there was no uh, guarantee in the Constitution for uh, civil liberties. And the answer of the Federalists to that originally was, well, we don't need a Bill of Rights because the states are responsible for, for building a Bill of Rights into their constitutions. And at the time, all 13 of the states did have a Bill of Rights in the constitutions. Um, and today that's also true in Ohio, as well as uh, every other state, there is a Bill of Rights in the state constitutions. But the Anti-Federalists were not um, willing to let all civil liberties just be up to the states. They felt that they, it was important to codify those liberties at a national level too, in order to check the power of the, the national government as well. And so uh, the Federalists agreed, they backed down from their stand and the Bill of Rights were, passing the Bill of Rights was one of the first actions that our first ever um, Congress uh, passed in 1791 after the 1790 uh, congressional election that kicked off um, the, the legislature of the United States. Um, and all of our rights uh, start out with the term Congress shall make no law, uh, for example, restricting the freedom of religion or restricting the freedom of speech. Um, and that's really important because it shows us that the point of these, the Bill of Rights is really to protect individuals from the power of the government. All right, so we're, we're gonna start a, a little unit here of going through uh, the different rights and, and talking a little bit about what they are, maybe giving some examples. Um, so the First Amendment incorporates a whole lot of what we think of as fundamental uh, rights of citizens in the United States. And uh, the most uh, you know, commonly understood of that is the right to free speech. Um, free speech is, is considered to be uh, one of the things that sets apart a democracy from a uh, more authoritarian type of system. The fact that um, speech is allowed um, and very few limits are it. There are though some limits on free speech. So individuals do not have the right to say anything they want. Um, some uh, limits on free speech are that you cannot write uh, things about a, another person that are both false and damaging. So it's against the law, that's called libel. Uh, related uh, to that is slander, which is the same thing, only spoken statements. So basically you are not allowed to state a lie about someone that could, be, that could damage their uh, reputation. You can say true things about them that would damage their rep reputation, but you can't say false things about them that would damage their reputation. Uh, there are some limits to that, including um, if you are a celebrity or a person who has put themselves into the public eye, um, it's a lot harder to, uh, to sue somebody for libel or slander. So politicians are rarely able to be successful in libel and slander cases, but you and I uh, could, if our neighbor or someone we knew uh, said or, or wrote something damaging about us and it was a lie, we, and we could prove it was a lie, we could sue them. Um, uh, obscenity, sexually explicit material, pornography, et cetera, is not unlimited. Uh, uh, both the US government and states are allowed to limit obscenity. Um, what's called fighting words or words that incite what the court has called imminent lawless action or present a clear and present danger to others. 
Uh, so in other words, the clear and present danger, the classic example of that is uh, you cannot, you are not free to yell fire in a crowded theater. Um, and that goes back to court cases in the 1920s. Uh, and then later on, um, an even higher standard uh, or, or more, I guess, lenient standard for speech uh, came into effect, which is that you could say what you wanted as long as it did not incite people to immediately break the law. You could even imply that they might have to break the law at some time in the future, but you could not imply uh, that they, you could not say to people, for example, uh, let's let's grab, in, in a speech, you could not say, let's everybody grab a, a rock and throw it through that, uh, the window of the Capitol building. That would be, um, that's, that type of speech is allowed to be limited by the government. Um, Commercial speech, such as advertisements uh, that are meant for uh, to promote business, are not covered under the First Amendment, meaning that you can't just say anything. Uh, when I was a kid, this became a big issue because there were a lot of um, laws that were being passed about false advertising and advertising to children uh, to put limits around things like that. Um, so when I was a, a kid, there used to be a commercial for Wonder Bread where a kid would take a bite of a piece of bread and they would grow and, and literally it would look like they grew a lot, really fast in, in just with taking a bite of the bread. And uh, that was one of the things that was not allowed because it gave um, a false impression that um, you would grow literally before any, someone's eyes if you ate this bread. Um, there are also many other uh, limits on commercial speech. For example, it's no longer, you're no longer allowed to have um, advertisements for cigarettes on um, TV uh, or before movies or things like that. Those are, those are allowed. Um, the highest standard, the least amount of um, restrictions are allowed to be put onto political speech. Um, and I think I hope it's pretty obvious why uh, the you know the real reasoning behind that is because um, the in a democracy you want to make sure that the government does not have the right to stifle political speech that might be oppositional to whoever's in government uh, because that would uh, that would really take away the freedom of society to uh, to change who was in office or change the government uh, break the social contract essentially. Um, and so uh, one of the things that, that we use as political scientists to distinguish between a free society and an unfree society like an authoritarian regime is the extent to which speech is um, political speech and, and opposition speech is limited. Um, and for example, in Russia today, which is uh, very much an authoritarian state uh, today, um, uh, President Putin uh, has been known to put people in jail for saying things that he that cr are critical of, of his government. And just here's some examples of political speech uh, is uh, it's very um, typical to, for people who are don't like a, a, a um, candidate or a person in office to compare them to Hitler. So we see there George Bush and um, President Obama, uh, different political parties, but both in turn, um, both uh, were, were sort of victims of, of that uh, kind of political speech. Um, so uh, just Nazi uh, speech. Uh, oh, it looks like President Trump was also um, that, but also allowing um, uh, people of all types and all beliefs to uh, say what they want is uh, sort of classic, um, classic uh, liberal, uh, not liberal, liberal democracy in the old fashioned terms, which means uh, democracy that protects uh, liberties or liberal freedom, not, not liberal versus liberals and conservatives. That's a different understanding of that term. Okay, so the next civil liberty we'll talk about is freedom of the press, also part of the First Amendment. Uh, freedom of the press uh, is also critical to a democracy. It's one of the ways that we can measure whether a state really is a democracy, is to what extent the government limits uh, what the press can have access to or what the press can say. Again, a contrast to the United States, a free country would be a country like Russia, where uh, the, the, um, the press is absolutely controlled there by uh, Putin and Putin's regime, and, and they only say things that are approved by Putin. Um, 
So uh, freedom of the press is one of the, the least limited freedoms that we have, uh, especially out of the First Amendment. Um, the press is often considered what's called the fourth estate of government, meaning that part of its job is to protect um, the people and their liberties and using the free press is a way to do that. Um, they, uh, they have especially vigorously uh, pursued uh, their uh, uh, being against what are called prior restraint, what is called prior restraint meaning that the government cannot say before something is published in, in, the, in the press or, or shown in the press, whether that's the TV media, the newspapers, um, they cannot say before it's published, you are not allowed to publish this information. Um, and uh, there, there have been some important court cases that have defended that and, and turn, overturned prior restraint actions by the government where the government, the US government tried to limit something uh, from being published. Um, they've also, uh, they are also often protected from libel and slander, especially uh, it's a very high burden of proof to prove that a, that the press actually lied on purpose about something. Um, and in general with libel and slander, they have um, been found not guilty of libel and slander as long as it wasn't an intentional lie. Um, and uh, the press had a lot to do with passing what's called the Freedom of Information Act in the 1970s after the Watergate scandal to declassify uh, government documents and make them all available to the press. Um, and I just want to put in a plug for the movie The Post, uh, which is a, a feature film from uh, this year, 2018. Um, and uh, it, it really talks about prior restraint and a court case that overturned the government's attempts to stop publication of what were called the Pentagon Papers. So uh, very important freedom, very hard to limit in the United States, the press. Much to the chagrin of most presidents who have, um, you know, it's not just President Trump who struggles with um, what the press says about them. Uh, freedom of assembly, another First uh, Amendment right. Uh, freedom of assembly means that individual uh, people um, and groups have the right to protest government actions or rally um, for a political statement. We've had a lot of those type of activities in the last year or so, so um, they are often. So as long as they are peaceful, um, they don't involve violence or any sort of um, breaking laws like, uh, you know, damaging property or something like that, they're allowed. However, freedom of assembly is, um, this is a place where the courts have been pretty um, open to limitations on um, the, the uh, venues. Uh, where can you protest? How many people can you have? Those kind of things. Uh, they have very much let governments, especially local governments, make rules about that on the basis of public safety. Um, so local governments especially can limit uh, when uh, rallies are allowed to take place. Generally speaking, they're not usually allowed at night. Um, where they're allowed to be and uh, what type of activities are allowed at them. Um, the only thing the government, uh, the, the restriction there is that the government may not uh, make different rules for one group rather than another based on the content of their speech. Um, and so there have been some famous cases where groups like, uh, like white supremacists or neo-Nazi groups have wanted to, um, to assemble and they are, they have to be treated by local governments um, the same way that the local government would treat any other group, like a veterans group or a, um, the Boy Scouts or something who wanted to have, um, have a march. Uh, so they can restrict time, place, and manner, but they can't make that any different for um, a group that has what might be considered more controversial or more um, objectionable speech. Uh, religious freedom, that's one that a lot of people think about also in the First Amendment. Um, and uh, the uh, religious freedom certainly draws way back to uh, the, the founding of the colonies here um, that, you know, some colonies uh, many colonies were built in some way on religious freedom. Some of them, such as Massachusetts, were built on the freedom to practice a particular religion and actually to establish a particular religion. Um, so the Puritan religion became the, uh, the dominant official religion in, um, 
in some states, including Massachusetts for a while. Um, some states, uh, such as Delaware uh, and Rhode Island, were, were founded as colonies specifically so that there was no religion uh, that would be preferred over another one. Um, and then some other colonies were built uh, specifically for, uh, including the colony of Maryland, specifically for the uh, uh, Roman Catholic religion to be free uh, to practice their religion. Um, so different colonies had kind of different uh, motives for freedom of religion. Um, in the Constitution, there are two types of freedom of religion, and they're different from each other. Uh, the first one is the No Establishment Clause, which says Congress cannot establish a national religion or in any way seem to prefer one religion over another or even to prefer having a religion over no religion or atheism um, and that is, that no establishment clause gets invoked for things like um, no uh, there can be no official religious activities in public schools or um, it's not okay to uh, show a christian christmas display um, out in front of a uh, building that's owned by the government, like a courthouse. Um, and there are some compromises there. Uh, for example, in Ohio, uh, it's okay to have a Christian Christmas display if it is also accompanied by uh, this, uh, winter holiday displays from other religions as well. But that's the no establishment clause. And then the free exercise clause is really a different kind of freedom of religion, which is that Congress cannot stop anybody from practicing their religion. Um, and here we have seen many court cases where uh, towns and states have tried to make laws against uh, things or apply laws to, uh, to the exercise of religion. Um, a, an example would be uh, Native American religions that use um, what are considered to be illegal hallucinogenic drugs as part of their religious ceremonies. Uh, and the Supreme Court has upheld their right to use those in those relig in a limited fashion in those religious ceremonies, despite the fact that there are existing laws against, uh, against purchase and, um, and possession of those drugs. Uh, so those are the kind of things that get uh, talked about in free exercise. This means that your school can never uh, prevent you from wearing uh, a t-shirt or a cross or some other symbol of your uh, religious uh, belief, can't prohibit um, people from wearing a religious garb, maybe a, a veil um, over the hair for a female or a yarmulke for a male, a Jewish person, uh, those kind of things. Um, okay, some other civil liberties that are not in the First Amendment, uh, the right to privacy, uh, which is actually means that uh, we have privacy from the government um, uh, surveying us or being involved in what are considered to be pr private matters and private decisions. Um, this, uh, the court found in Roe versus Wade, which is the abortion decision, that there is a right to privacy that can be based on the, the what's written in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Um, and since that case, uh, there have been other cases decided about privacy, um, many of which have nothing to do with uh, reproductive rights at all. Uh, things like, uh, you know, government surveillance of uh, red light cameras or uh, you can't, uh, the government can't bug your conversations or listen in on your private phone conversations, those kind of things. Um, now, uh, something that kind of uh, went up against rights to free speech and also privacy uh, happened in uh, 2001 after the, um, the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11 um, on, on the World Trade Center. Uh, Congress passed the Patriot Act, which did limit um, the right to privacy. Um, and it allowed uh, the government to uh, have more right to conduct secret searches and seizures, which would typically be against the Eighth Amendment, um, to listen in on phone and internet communication, um, to access personal records, uh, to detain citizens without probable cause if uh, they determined that there was a national security risk. Um, and that was reauthorized by Congress in 2006 and, um, and again in 2010. 
Um, one way that this came into play was after the Boston Marathon bombings, the, uh, the federal government detained and interrogated uh, suspects, uh, the suspects in that case of the bombing uh, without uh, their uh, their Miranda rights being read to them without uh, informing them of their right to remain silent and their right to an attorney. Uh, they were not represented uh, because it was considered a terrorist case. Okay, um, throughout history, the Patriot Act is only one of the ways that uh, the government has successfully limited civil liberties. Typically, um, in American history, civil liberties have uh, are, are sort of have come under the most fire and been the easiest to limit by the, the government has had the, an easier time limiting them in times of national security problems. Um, and so the Sedition Act of 1798 was um, in response to British spying that eventually led up to the hostilities of the War of 1812. Um, during the Civil War, actually, uh, President Lincoln suspended the right of habeas corpus and um, uh, held, jailed and held uh, um, free United States citizens in um, some of the border states who were suspected of cooperating with or, or spying on behalf of uh, being sympathetic to the Southern cause. Um, during World War I, the Alien and Sedition Acts were revived, again, um, trying to... Uh, um, catch uh, people uh, who were supporting the enemy. Uh, during World War II, there were a number of suspensions of civil liberties, uh, probably the, the most egregious of those. Uh, biggest mistake, as far as I'm concerned, uh, was the internment of um, citizens of Japanese ancestry, many of whom were second and third generation Japanese people who'd been born in the United States and lived here for uh, at least a generation, if not two generations. Um, and they were, uh, because of their race, suspected of being sympathetic to the Japanese, uh, the, the country of Japan with whom we were at war. Um, Limitations on liberties uh, regarding um, people suspected of being communists or communist sympathizers during the Cold War. Many of you are aware of the uh, McCarthy investigations and McCarthy investigations of uh, suspected communists. Uh, similar type of things during the Vietnam War. And then again, with the Patriot Act and other issues like that um, in the war on terrorism. So our liberties.